welcome to the Revenge Story Times channel. It was Friday, and I left the hangar earlier than usual. The guys had things they needed to take care of, and after that, they would probably leave since I wasn't there. I was eagerly anticipating the evening with my lovely wife, Zoe. We had known each other for almost six years and had been married for three and a half. We were both 29. Our intimacy had been a bit slow lately, and over the past month or so, she seemed a little distracted. So, I decided to do everything I could to make the evening special, a bottle or two of good wine, a couple of ribeye steaks from the butcher, roses from the florist instead of the supermarket. I planned to light some candles and hopefully find out what had been bothering her. I wanted to show her my love and, with any luck, have an early night. I got home long before she did. I made sure the house was clean, put fresh sheets on the bed, and set up candles in the bedroom. I set the table in the kitchen using our best silverware and napkins. I opened a bottle of wine to let it breathe. I placed the roses by the front door so she would see and smell them as soon as she walked in, she loves the scent of roses. I prepared the potatoes for my signature scallop potatoes in the oven, thin slices of potatoes lightly drizzled with olive oil, seasoned with salt, pepper, and a little rosemary. I used mustard powder to carefully sprinkle on the steaks, adding just the right touch of flavor. Everything was ready for her arrival. I was quite pleased with how everything had turned out. All that was left was to wait for the love of my life to show up so I could sweep her off her feet and show her how deeply I cared for her. I hoped this feeling would last the entire weekend. I heard the front door open just as I was laying out the potato slices on the baking tray, the oven was preheating. I heard Zoe call out to me, Richard, are you home? That's odd, I thought. My car was parked on the road in front of the house, and the roses by the door should have made it obvious I was here. I had just finished sprinkling the rosemary on the potatoes when I heard her say, all right, we got here first. We can sit on the couch, when he walks in, it'll look better if we're sitting and he's standing. He won't be startled when we tell him. Tell me what? I asked, stepping into the living room, where I was met by a shocked Zoe and another man. At first glance, I knew who this man was. Zoe had been talking about him for the past couple of months. He was the new deputy head of HR, just over 180 centimeters tall, fit, blonde, handsome, and a little arrogant. I must have had a confused expression on my face. He wasn't taking things too seriously and just extended his hand. Hey, Dick, I'm Gerald. In a daze, I shook his hand. He had a firm grip, a very firm grip. He stopped just short of crushing my hand. What a jerk. I just stood there. He smiled at me. Zoe spoke up, Richard, we need to tell you something. Was he staying for dinner? I could defrost an extra steak, and Gerald would eat it, she continued. I'm going to spend the weekend with Gerald. It'll be just one weekend. I didn't see that coming. What? No. Gerald stepped forward. This will be good for you. I'm going to teach her things you can only dream of. You'll enjoy being with her more after this. It's only for one weekend, and she'll never do anything like this again. No, never. I started to snap out of my shock. If she does, I'll divorce her. Gerald walked right up to me, looked down at me, and said in a threatening voice, No, you won't. You can't stop me. Still in that same threatening tone, he said, No, I can't stop you, but I promise on the day you file for divorce, you. You'll have trouble walking. From that day on, your life will be filled with pain. The choice is yours. He stood next to Zoe and smiled at me. Then, he continued in a normal voice, she's going to spend the weekend with me, and I'm going to teach her a lot. She'll come back to you, and I'll never sleep with her again. She'll stay loyal to you after this weekend. He looked at Zoe. Right, sweetheart? What a joke, calling her sweetheart. I was stunned and had no idea what to do. Have you already been together? I accused them, assuming it from the way he called her sweetheart. No, we haven't. That would be cheating, Zoe exclaimed, and this isn't. 
I need a drink. I'll get you a beer, she offered. I growled at her, I think I can at least do that myself. Gerald placed his hand on her shoulder. Give him a minute, sweetheart. He's going to need time to process this. We've been talking about it for weeks, and we just dropped it on him in a few minutes. He needs time to realize that this is inevitable. He'll agree. They always do. It was clear he had done this before. I rushed to the kitchen. I had a feeling Zoe wanted to follow me, but he held her back. At that moment, it was probably a good idea on his part. And what was with him calling her sweetheart? That really infuriated me. What an idiot. When I got to the kitchen, I saw the open bottle of wine. I poured a glass and took a big gulp. No, wine wasn't the right drink for this situation. I stormed into the garage where I kept my beer fridge. I almost tore the door off its hinges when I opened it, grabbing a bottle of crafty old hen. I slammed the fridge door shut. What a couple of damn fools, I thought to myself. I looked around for a bottle opener but couldn't find one. It must have been in the kitchen. Damn it! I didn't want to go back inside until I had gathered my thoughts. I used alternative methods we learned in the army. I placed the edge of the bottle cap on a sharp corner of the workbench and gave it a strong hit from above. It worked back then, and it worked now. The cap flew off into the corner. I didn't pay attention to it. How was I going to deal with this? I gradually started calming down, thought for a few minutes, and then a plan formed in my mind. I walked to the other end of the garage, opened the cabinet, took what I needed, and tucked it into the back pocket of my pants. I took a big gulp, finished my beer, grabbed another, and headed back to the kitchen. This time, I opened the bottle properly with a bottle opener and prepared something else. I carefully slid the largest knife from the knife block into the back of my pants, along with the other item. It was just for show, I had no intention of ending up in jail. I felt confident in my plan. That was it. I took a deep breath and walked back into the living room. These cheating idiots were sitting on my couch, holding hands. I looked at them. They quickly let go of each other's hands and scooted apart slightly. Good. The balance of power had shifted a little in my favor. It seemed they were waiting for me. I pulled out my phone and tossed it onto the coffee table. It was blatantly obvious that it was recording. He stood up, noticing my anger, and spread his arms. Listen, buddy, it's only going to be for one weekend. That irritated me even more. A jerk like him would never be a buddy. He glanced at my phone. I think you're recording this. That's fine, but you know what'll happen if this gets posted on social media. The pain you'll feel won't even compare to having both of your legs broken. You understand? I want to record this for my protection and, strangely enough, for yours and hers as well, I replied. Don't even think about sending this to work. Since I'm the deputy head of HR, all complaints come through me. I've got friends who will let me know if anyone tries to bypass me. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Got it? I understand, I answered seriously, looking up at him. I have a proposal on how we can handle this, I said. He just smirked at me, arrogant jerk. Nodding toward the phone, I added, for the record, tell me what you plan to do with my wife. He puffed up like a peacock. I'm going to take your wife away for the weekend and give her an experience she's never had before. She'll learn new and exciting ways for us to please each other. Then she'll come back to you, much more prepared to give you the pleasure you've been missing. He smirked, though probably not until the next weekend because she'll be so sore she won't even be able to walk straight. He chuckled. I didn't believe a single word of that nonsense. And what happens after that? I asked. She comes back home to you, having experienced the best time of her life. But she promised me she'll remain faithful to you every single day for as long as she lives. She'll show you new skills and techniques that will drive you crazy. I looked at Zoe. Zoe, is this what you want? Yes, please, Richard. 
It's just one weekend, and after that, I promise I'll be faithful to you. Turning to Gerald, I asked, and what if she doesn't keep her promises, just like she promised to be faithful to me on our wedding day? What if she cheats on me again? Will you come back and torment her physically, like you've threatened to do to me? Or what if some god of sex shows up and offers her something even better? My voice dripped with sarcasm, which clearly didn't register with him. He looked confused. I guess no one had ever asked him something like that before. She promised me she'll stay loyal to you after this weekend. Yeah, like I believe everything she says right now. Here's the deal, I'll fight you for her. He was a few centimeters taller and broader in the shoulders than me, and a little younger, but he just smiled, arrogant jerk. If that's what you want, we can do it. I don't want to waste the weekend, so let's settle this here and now. I'm in, I replied. Zoe pressed her palms to her mouth, the way she does when she's nervous. Two men fighting over me. How exciting. There was a spark in her eyes. I looked at her and growled, I'm not fighting for you. You're not worth it. I'm fighting for my self-respect. The spark in her eyes faded, and her face became serious. Turning to him, I said, if I win, you'll leave and never speak to her again, not even at work. If you win, you get to spend the weekend with her, and I won't divorce her. But there are rules. He still had that smug look on his face. All right, let's hear them. The first one to fall on his back loses. No knives, no weapons. Everything else is fair game, and whoever wins, no calling the police. Fine, no police. Do you have any knives? He smirked at me. At that, I pulled out a large, 30 centimeters butcher's knife from the waistband of my pants and placed it on the coffee table. His eyes widened. And I suppose you've got a gun too, he asked, still smirking. With a smile, I reached behind my back and pulled out an air pistol, an exact replica of a combat pistol. I don't know if he knows about guns, but that gun looked real, especially when I pulled it out. Now he wasn't quite as confident, but he didn't hide his arrogance. I'm going to beat the hell out of you before I put you on your back. Do your worst, you idiot. Just remember the three rules, no knives, no weapons, and no police. I'm not stupid. I get it, you little punk. You'll pay for this. I might even keep her with me for the whole week. If you win, at least I'll respect myself for trying to defend my marriage. I won't be ashamed every time I look in the mirror. Suddenly, Zoe changed her mind. She recognized my behavior and determination from the past. Things might not go the way she had planned. No, please stop. I've changed my mind, Richard. Don't do this, please. Gerald, leave now. I don't want this anymore. She realized that I was gaining the upper hand. I growled at her, too late, sweetheart. You started this with him weeks ago, and I'm going to finish it here and now, one way or another. Grab your phone and record it. She was crying. This was no longer in her control. I motioned toward the kitchen door. After you, I said to Gerald. He walked through the kitchen and headed toward the back door. I grabbed a few of my preparations. As soon as he stepped outside, I kicked him in the back, sending him face first into the flower bed. He scrambled to his feet and turned around, eyes blazing with anger. I just smiled and said, no rules. Not entirely true, but that didn't matter. The point was made, he was furious. Just what I wanted. The balance of power shifted even further in my favor. It would have been nice if he had fallen on his back, but I didn't expect it. He swung at me with his right hand. He might as well have called ahead to warn me about the punch. It was so slow I easily blocked it and then threw the contents of my right hand, salt, pepper, rosemary, and mustard powder, into his face. He clutched his face, screaming. I tried to push him down onto his back, but he managed to step backward. He lowered his hand and looked at me through tears, with snot running from his nose. I just walked up and punched him in the stomach as hard as I could. 
He doubled over but didn't fall. Now he was holding one hand on his stomach and the other on his face. I need him in the groin with all my strength. He collapsed onto his knees and started retching. He didn't have enough hands to hold everything that was hurting. I tried to push him onto his back, but he resisted, so I punched him hard in the face. He wobbled on his knees but still didn't fall onto his back. My right fist landed on his nose, and blood sprayed everywhere. Damn, that had to hurt. You don't see that kind of pain on TV. I slapped him across the face with my open hand. His head snapped back, and then I hit him with the back of my hand. That was a dumb move, and my hand hurt like hell. I leaned in close to him and quietly said, you can stop this. All you have to do is lie on your back. I raised my hand again. His knees buckled, and he collapsed onto his side, then rolled onto his back. The balance of power was fully in my favor. I glanced at Zoe. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. I couldn't tell why she was crying. Grabbing Gerald by the hair, I yanked him to his feet. I wasn't gentle. I opened the gate to our garden and told him, remember this. You will never speak to her again, coward. And if the police come to visit me, this beating will seem like nothing. I shoved him through the gate and closed it behind him. The smell was gone too. He had clearly soiled himself. Zoe was still there, recording everything. Send me a copy of that video to my phone, I said as I walked past her into the kitchen and washed my hands at the sink. At least Gerald would smell of rosemary from what I'd thrown on him earlier. I headed upstairs, and Zoe followed me. I grabbed a suitcase from the spare bedroom. I started taking her underwear out of the drawer and packing it into the suitcase. What are you doing? I'm yours, she said, watching me as I continued to pack her things. We agreed I wouldn't divorce you if I lost, but as you just said, I won, which means I'm divorcing you. I suggest you go stay with your parents. I carried the suitcase downstairs, opened the front door, and threw it outside. I picked up my phone and dialed her mother's number. Hello, Richard. This is a pleasant surprise. What can I do for you? Mary, would you be so kind as to come pick up your daughter? I'm divorcing her. With that, I hung up the phone. I sent her the audio recording of Gerald boasting about how he was going to spend the weekend with her daughter, and she said that's exactly what she wanted. Then I turned off my phone. I took Zoe by the hand, led her outside, then closed and locked the door behind her. I ignored the knocking, and after a while, it stopped. I expected a visit from the police, but they never came. Maybe Gerald was too ashamed to admit he'd been beaten by someone smaller than him. No matter. I spent Saturday sorting through all of Zoe's belongings and doing some calculations. When my grandparents passed away, the house was left to my sister and me. I took out a small mortgage to buy out her half. I'm sure I'll need to reimburse Zoe for the portion she paid toward the mortgage. I edited the video and audio clips and sent them to every email address I could find at Zoe's workplace. Idiots like Gerald must have made some enemies along the way. I'm sure they'll make sure this reaches the head of HR. On Sunday morning, Zoe's father came by to pick up the rest of her things. He looked at me and asked, is there any way that you could? I guess the expression on my face gave him the answer to the question he didn't finish. We shook hands as he left. I suspect Zoe's parents were one of the reasons the divorce went so quietly. It's been just over four months since I filed for divorce. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was in the garage cleaning my air guns. I had a shooting competition the next day. I heard the doorbell ring. I was about to get up when someone called out, it's okay. I'll get it. It was Clara, the woman who kept my house in order. Clara appeared at the garage door. There's a lady at the door who says she's your wife. About 170 centimeters tall, blonde hair, around 30 years old, maybe a little more. I've put the kettle on and left her in the living room. I went to the living room. It was Zoe. She looked nice, she had tried, but she seemed about five years older. 
She didn't look well. This was the first time I had seen her since I'd kicked her out. What do you want? I'm paying you the agreed amount for the house. She looked at me. Richard, I'm so sorry. I made a terrible mistake. He convinced me and promised everything would be okay. He told me that if you really loved me, you would let me go through with it. He sounded so convinced. He even had one of the girls tell me how it worked for her. Is that other girl still married? I knew the answer, but she wasn't sure. I don't know. I don't work there anymore. After everyone got the video and audio recordings, I was so ashamed. No one wanted to talk to me. I had to leave. I have to ask. Are you still seeing Gerald? No, I never intended to. He kept his side of the deal and never spoke to me again, but he didn't stay long. He missed a few days of work, and by then, everything had fallen apart, and they kicked him out of the building. Rumor has it another husband beat him up. It wasn't me. When I dragged him to the back gate, I warned him. The police never showed up at my door, but I kept looking over my shoulder and stayed away from dark places. Serves him right. He's not a decent man, decent men don't sleep with other people's wives. Please, Richard, can we try again? I'll never do something so stupid again. Please. I really love you, and I thought it was for your own good, but I'm sorry, honey. It was a mistake, and I never should have done it. She pleaded with me. At that moment, Clara entered, carrying a tray with cups, saucers, a teapot, a milk jug, and some biscuits. Setting the tray down on the coffee table, she said, you might want to let it steep for a while. Then she disappeared back into the kitchen. Zoe watched her leave. Or have you already found someone to replace me? That's Clara. She cleans here once a week. She's a cleaner at our hangar. I work so much that I don't have time for it myself. I had to take out an extra mortgage just to pay you. So, is there any chance, please, Richard? I poured myself some tea and took a sip. It was weak, and I should have waited, just like Clara had suggested. It's been almost four months, and I haven't heard a word from you. You haven't contested the divorce. Why now? She looked down at her knees, embarrassed. I know I made a terrible mistake. I wanted to give you time. I hoped you'd miss me, and I had to gather the courage. My mom said that if you love me, you could give me another chance. Dad said I'm wasting my time, but I had to try. Richard, please. I took another sip of tea. Clara came in with a tray full of cleaning supplies and headed upstairs. I'm just going to tidy up upstairs. There's nothing in your bedroom I shouldn't see, right? She chuckled softly. Hope you've put away all your bondage gear. And with that, she ran upstairs without waiting for an answer. I looked at Zoe. That's her little joke. You know we never got into anything like that. Maybe we should have, but you never wanted to explore anything out of the ordinary, except with that idiot. Even doggy style was too much for you. Zoe looked at me, but I didn't answer her question. I was still angry with her, but I kept myself in check. What do you think? You blindsided me, telling me you wanted to spend the weekend with another man. You planned it for weeks and gave me two minutes to decide, threatening me with violence if I didn't agree. You got excited at the thought of two men fighting over you, hoping your lover would win so you could enjoy your weekend of wild sex, then come back and expect everything to go back to normal. But for me, that would have been the new normal, and in your mind, I would never have been as good as your lover. Yes, I was excited when the two of you were about to fight for me, but then I saw you pull out a knife and your air gun. That's when I realized I had made a mistake and that Gerald would never win. I didn't want you to go to jail because I put you in that situation. I'm truly sorry. Zoe, I loved you with all my heart. You killed that love when you told me you wanted to spend the weekend with him. For the past few weeks, you've been distant, quiet, and I thought something was wrong. I tried to cheer you up. 
Now I know why, you were planning to sleep with that jerk. I had a special dinner planned, and there were flowers. I was right there with you, but you listened to that scumbag instead. You didn't come and talk to me. You turned it into a done deal by threatening me with violence. How can you do that to someone you claim to love? I'll never be able to trust you again. In fact, it hurts just to be around you. She didn't touch her tea. I think it's time for you to go, I told her. She stood and headed for the front door. I opened it for her. She looked at me and said, I love you. I'm really sorry, but I understand. I threw one more line at her. Remember that girl who told you about Gerald? Yes, Karen Prescott. She's about to become Karen Jones. Her husband's making her take back her maiden name. She turned and walked away in tears. I didn't watch where she went. I wondered how Clara was doing upstairs. I went up and saw that my bedroom door was open. Walking in, I unbuttoned my shirt and tossed it on the floor. Clara would probably scold me for that later, but I didn't care. I stepped into the bedroom and saw Clara lying on my bed, the blanket pulled back, wearing black stockings and a smile. I couldn't find your bondage gear. That's because I don't have any. Too bad. I would have liked to try it. By now, I was down to just my underwear. I went to the bathroom, took the belt from my robe, and, returning to the bedroom, said to Clara, this should do. Let's try it. She jumped up, turned around, and put her hands behind her back. I quickly tied them. I laid her down on her back and slipped my head between her stocking-clad thighs. Almost an hour later, Clara was resting her head on my shoulder. One of her legs, still in the black stocking, was draped over mine. Looking up at me, she said, I should really thank Zoe, but I can't find it in my heart to be grateful for the pain she caused you. It'd be like thanking her for hurting you. She smiled. When your divorce is final, and I move in permanently, we'll have to try that tying up again. It was the first I'd heard about her moving in for good, but I didn't complain. As we were drifting off to sleep, I heard Clara say, I want to learn everything Zoe didn't. We fell into a peaceful sleep. Thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Revenge Storytimes. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.